The words in the German national anthem adopted by the Weimar government in 1922 was intended to remind the Germans that they were now unified instead of being split into so many separate regions. And according to Mr. Wolf in the Urban Dictionary, the line in the German anthem Ich liebe dich über alles in der Welt in English said, I love you more than anything else in the world. And the words über alles and über Mensch were purposely mistranslated by the Allies during Hitler's war to become words that meant supermen all over the world so that people would be afraid that the Germans thought they were superior to everyone else and that they meant to conquer the entire planet. Both the AAs and the Nazis had been seeking purity and were on a quest for spiritual enhancement beyond their simple health food and cold plunge baths at sunrise. And on September 11, 1915, Bill W. asked Lois to marry him when she was 22 and he was 18 years old. Bill W. had met Lois at Emerald Lake when the summer people were out sailing, and Bill had taught himself to sail from a book. After they were engaged, Bill and Lois went to Staten Island to cook some steaks for a picnic, and they set Staten Island on fire. And when the fire department showed up, Lois was embarrassed because she wasn't wearing a hat. They had a big church wedding on the 24th of January in 1918 while Bill was in military school training recruits to go fight Pancho Villa, and while Bill's army buddies were teaching him to drink, Lois never had anyone from whom she could learn about drinking. Lois had been a tomboy and was sent to elementary school at the fancy Pratt Institute that had been the first in America to have a new kind of preschool imported from Germany called a kindergarten. And in Quaker High School, Lois was the class secretary and she played basketball, and when she graduated in 1912, Lois went to Packer Art College for two years where she studied interior decorating. Lois got a job teaching at a children's school in New Jersey, and then she worked as a secretary at the Young Women's Christian Association the same year that the Russians were revolting. Lois knew that she'd grown up in a good family, and some of her classmates were President Lincoln's great-grandchildren. And Lois's grandfather had been a minister in the Church of the New Jerusalem, and he'd translated the Bible from the original Hebrew, and John Johnny Appleseed had attended his church. Lois had lots of brothers and sisters, and she also had a pony, and her father had once been spanked by President James Buchanan after knocking off his top hat with a snowball, and Lois's grandfather's first cousin had married the John D. Re Rockefeller, and Lois's parents had servants, and their first coachman had been the son of a slave, and their last coachman became a chauffeur as soon as cars became available. The first car Lois's parents bought had no windshield, but had a very fancy name, and even though the chauffeur had a new title, he still had to fill the stoves with coal and polish the front doorknob. Bill W. became a second lieutenant and was stationed at Fort Rodham, Rodman, Fort Rodman, where he learned to drink and Bill was sent overseas to fight in the Great War, and just as his boat was reaching England there was a big bump because an American ship had thrown a depth charge at a German submarine that had fired a torpedo at Bill's ship. But the torpedo had missed, and Bill had kept his head, and he'd ordered his men safely onto the deck. Arriving safely in England, an epidemic kept Bill and his regiment detained at a camp near Winchester, Depressed, lonely, and apprehensive about what lay ahead, Bill went to Winchester Cathedral. Inside the great cathedral, the atmosphere impressed itself so deeply upon him that he was taken by a sort of ecstasy, moved and stirred by, quote, tremendous, a tremendous sense of presence. Pass it on, page 60. Outside in the church hill, outside in the churchyard, outside in the churchyard, he saw a headstone that said, here lies a Hampshire grenadier who caught his death, drinking cold small beer. A good soldier is ne'er forgot, whether he dieth by musket or by pot. 
Alcoholics Anonymous, the story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. New York Works Publishing, Inc. by the Cornwall Press, Inc. April 1939, page 10. Bill W. was almost promoted several times, but the Army got the names mixed up, so someone with the same name received his promotions, and instead Bill was given a watch. Lois wanted to help fight the Great War, but the YWCA would not send her overseas because her family's religion was not considered Christian, and instead Lois became an occupational therapist on the shell shock ward at Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C. Lois wondered if Bill would be affected by the war, but she need not have worried because Bill's good friend Alcohol was standing him in good stead. When the flu ended the Great War, the whole world experienced a level of sickness that it has not seen before or since, and the flu was too horrible to result in much historical recording because everyone was too busy treating sick people to write about it. When Bill W. came home from the Great War, he got a job as a bookkeeper for the New York Central Railroad. But Bill thought he was too good for the job, and the Green Book said that he turned socialist for a while due to, quote, the socialist plum plan for taking over the railroads, quote, close quote. Pass it on, page 63. Bill W. then got a job working with the Carpenters Union on the piers, but he quit instead of joining the union, and Bill said that he'd been threatened, but rough work makes rough talk. Lois got a job working with the Red Cross at the Brooklyn Naval Hospital on the psychopathic ward, and Bill got drunk and enrolled in night school to become a lawyer at a division of St. Lawrence University, which had seemed like a good idea at the time. When Bill W. was ready to graduate from law school in 1924, he was too drunk to pass his final exam, and he would make it up later even though he never picked up his diploma. Bill, Bill applied for a job with Thomas Edison, and he took the Edison test and did so well that Edison wanted to hire him, and Bill was even given a personal interview by Edison himself, but Bill turned down the job and became an insurance investigator at US F&G instead, although he did not like his new job either. Lois got a new job, too, working at Bellevue Hospital on the women's psychiatric ward, and that job paid better, so with her increased earnings, they got a nicer apartment that was an expensive place on Livingston Street. They rented the next-door apartment and knocked down the wall to make it bigger, and the apartment building had a Rosicrucian elevator man from West India who would often help a drunken Bill get home, and Bill bought his daughter a piano as a thank you. During Prohibition, Bill W. made dandelion wine and bathtub gin, and Bill got drunk and Lois tried beating him up, but Bill would not stay sober. Lois had her first ectopic pregnancy in 1922, and she thought that maybe Bill was drinking because they couldn't have children. So she took him to an adoption agency, but the agency turned them down because of Bill's drinking. Instead, Lois learned to read Braille, while Bill kept kept himself busy playing with radios, having built one of the first super heterodynes in town in 1919, and with the Nazi back-to-nature craze sweeping the planet, they went together on a walking trip from Maine to Vermont, and they would stop to work at farms when they ran out of money. Bill W. only drank when he was in town, not while they were on their hiking trips, and on one farm, Bill and Lois worked for five weeks doing such a good job that they were asked back for another year, but they said no, thank you. The farmer offered them a raise, but they still said no, and they'd been given $75 a month plus room and board, and the farmer raised it to $100, but Bill W. instead went for a job on Wall Street that paid 200 a month plus stock options, and he especially liked the stock option part because America was on a roll. People were flocking to Wall Street because they didn't want to be communists, and they thought of Wall Street as the heart of capitalism, and Bill became a market analyst by buying a Harley-Davidson motorcycle with a sidecar so he could ride up and down the eastern seaboard visiting factories and businesses to research potential investments. When he was a kid, 
Bill had a motorcycle, and when Bill and Lois bought the Harley, their Syrian landlord gave them a bottle of Arak to keep them warm on the bike, and Lois sewed some waterproof coveralls for them to wear. They went on the road in April of 1925, and before they left, they bought two shares of General Electric and two shares of Portland Cement. Bill W.'s drinking friends on Wall Street were more than willing to take his investing advice as Bill telegraphed his recommendations back to New York City. And as they rode the motorcycle from one investing opportunity to another, Lois did more than her share of the driving so Bill could drink. And while Bill and Lois were on the road, Hitler's Mein Kampf went on sale in Germany. Roads for cars were a luxury at the time, and in 1914, Carl Fisher had promoted the Dixie Highway from Chicago to Miami at a time when there were over two million miles of rural roads in America, rural roads in America with less than 10% of them improved, closed, quote unquote improved. Roads at the time were more fit for motorcycles than for cars, as can be seen in the story told by F. Scott Fitzgerald entitled, entitled The Cruise of the Rolling Junk, where he drove with his wife in 1921 from Connecticut to Alabama in a 1918 six-cylinder Marmon Speedster. If you can imagine an endless rocky gully rising frequently in the form of unnavigable mounds to a slope of 60 degrees, a gully covered with from an inch to a foot of gray water mixed with solemn soggy clay of about the consistency of cold cream and the adhesiveness of triple glue, if you drove an ambulance over shelled roads in France and can conceive of all the imperfections of all those roads placed within 40 miles, then you have a faint conception of the roads of Upper North Carolina, the, no the Cruise of the Rolling Junk by F. Scott Fitzgerald, London, Hesperus Press, 1924, 2011, page 70. Carl Fisher liked racing cards, and he had built the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and had started the Prestolite Headlamp Company, and he received more money from Sieberling's Goodyear Tire Company to build a rock highway made with cement. Carl Fisher had been behind the Lincoln Highway that was started in 1912 to construct a road that would go from New York City to San Francisco through 13 states, although much of it was still barely drivable when Ike took his military caravan across the country in 1919. Carl Fisher wanted to buy millions of barrels of concrete from Portland Cement for building new roads, and Fisher had been a good drinker, so Bill W. had learned in the bars about Fisher's plans to make more roads with concrete, and Bill sent telegrams to his friends in New York City to buy stock in Portland Cement. The motorcycle trip in 1925 was dangerous because there were always farm animals jumping into the road since there weren't a lot of fences back then, and Lois and Bill W. would be on the road for a whole year, heading towards Florida for the winter and then back up to Canada. Lois and Bill W. dug clams on the beach, and they went skinny dipping, and one day when they were camping, Bill went into town to get supplies and left Lois alone in their tent, and she was glad because it was her turn to drink. The Green Book described Lois drinking with Bill right before they went to Egypt to see Portland Cement, which turned out to be a very lucrative investment, but no amount of money could keep Bill away from alcohol. The Great War had interfered with the construction of both the Lincoln Highway and the Dixie Highway, and when people wanted to travel beyond their home counties, they would just take the train, but during the war the military had also commandeered all the trains. Motorcycles didn't need much smooth surface such motorcycles didn't need such smooth surfaces as cars, so motorcycle sales had boomed during the Great War, and Bill W. and Lois not only had a lot of fun being motorcycle hobos in 1925, but they found plenty of good deals for investing in stocks on their bike trip and made lots of people on Wall Street very rich. In the summer of 1926, they went on the road again for more market analyzing, but this time they went in a used DeSoto with curtains in the windows so they could sleep beside the road. 
After that, Bill W. would spend a few years being a very important man, and he took up playing golf with other well-off people, and Bill liked golf because he could spend the whole day drinking. No matter that Bill W. presented himself as a golfer, Bill never really got the gentleman's rules down, and he would become argumentative and pushy when he drank. Before the stock market crashed in 1929, Bill began writing heartfelt promises to quit drinking into the family Bible, and the stock market would get back on its feet before Bill did. American capital had been fleeing into Germany while the Nazi party was becoming very popular, and a cabal of bankers held a capital strike in 1928 to stop American money from helping Germany recover from the Great War. And with that credit freeze, Americans who had bought stocks on margin could no longer cover the dips. When the stock market crashed in October of 1929, Bill just went to the bar, and then he went to Canada. Bill W. conducted an interview with Harry Golden, who wrote Only in America, and Golden said, Men who had never seen a stock certificate suddenly acquired communal barroom status. For them, the panhandler, the failure, and the barfly, the stock market crash was the most wonderful event in their drab and uninteresting lives. Quote, J.P. Morgan lost all his dough. We were all wiped out, me included, close quote. Oh, how they stood, two and three deep at every bar and nursing a five-cent glass of beer and talking about the crash. Only in America by Harry Golden, New York, Perma Books, The World Publishing Company, 1944, 1958, page 293. Many people who'd been taking Bill W.'s advice lost a lot of money when the market crashed, and Bill went to Montreal to work for the Green Shields Company and would again be trading stocks by the new year in 1930. Lois and Bill moved to a fancy apartment called Glen Eagles, which was Scottish for Valley of the Eagles, and they had a view of the St. Lawrence River and played golf and drove a new Packard, and they would have dinner at the clubhouse, and Bill would be fired for drinking within the year, and he again wrote into the, fi into the family Bible that he promised he would stay sober, but it was not to be. Lois went to Brooklyn to take care of her mother who had bone cancer and was receiving radium treatments, and Bill went to jail in Montreal for fighting with the hotel employee. After a while, they both went to stay with Lois's parents in New York, and on Christmas Day in 1930, her mother died, and Bill stayed drunk for the whole week. Lois tried to get drunk herself several times, but couldn't catch on to it, and Bill got a job as an investigator with Stanley Statistics at $100 a week, but he thought he was worth more, and after working for one year, Bill got into a drunken fight with a cab driver and was fired from Stanley Statistics, and at the time he was $60,000 in debt. Lois went to work at Macy's in May of 1931 for $19 a week plus, sa plus a sales commission, while Bill W. hung out with the Wall Street types in the drinking establishments, and he drank around them, but was not one of them because people didn't trust him anymore. Sometimes he would just ride the subway with a bottle and a paper bag, and this went on for a year and four months, until Lois's brother-in-law got Bill W. a leg up in the stock market again with a few other investors, but they told him that if he drank he was out, no arguments. After some months of success, Bill Jub Bill W. joined one of their poker games, and somebody pulled out a jug of Applejack, and Bill tried to hold out, but when he thought about having never tasted Applejack, he realized it would be inexcusable to die without ever having tasted it. Applejack was apple brandy, and Bill W. would stay drunk for the next three days and lose his job. And sometime later, a nice man named Joe Hirschhorn, which was German for deer horn, offered Bill a job as a stock analyst. Hirschhorn was a broker who'd survived the crash and was one of the few people who would even talk to Bill W. in 1933. And Hirschhorn called Bill a schmaltz guy and sent him back to Canada where Bill got arrested for fighting again and had to look for another job. 
It should be remembered that the rivalry between Vermonters and Canadians was alive and well whether they were drunk or sober, but more often they were drunk. And Bill W. came back to live with Lois in her parents' house in New York at 182 Clinton Street. Lois had continued to work at Macy's with a three and a half dollar a week raise, and they would live alone in her parents' house when her father remarried and moved out in May of 1933. Bill W. continued to drink to excess, and Lois and Bill went on vacation to Vermont, and there they stayed with Bill's sister Dorothy and her husband Dr. Strong, and Lois hoped that getting away from New York City might help Bill stay sober. It worked for a while, and then Bill W. went fishing and found a man with a bottle. On another day, Bill went to get his teeth fixed, and instead of paying the dentist, he bought alcohol, after which he was able to stop drinking for a while by writing angry letters to Washington complaining about the New Deal. Bill W. said that the First National Bank and J.P. Morgan were his heroes, but he never published any of the papers he wrote in these bouts of sobriety, and when they went back to New York, Lois would give Bill money so he could go to the bar to look for work. One day a nice doctor prescribed a good strong sedative for Bill W., and then Bill would take his medicine with him to the bar, and Bill soon ended up in the hospital, where they gave him a year to live. At this time, alcohol was no longer Bill W.'s friend, but had become his master. Like Bill W.'s mother, Dr. Strong was an osteopath, and when Lois and Bill were back in New York, Bill just started staying in the house to get drunk, so Dr. Strong got Bill admitted into Charles Barnes Towns Hospital on Central Park West, which cost a lot of money at the end of 1933, but Dr. Strong paid the bill. Town's hospital catered to the very wealthy and accepted patients who could afford to pay a substantial amount of money for a five-day stay. And Bill W. got the belladonna treatment and he got the exercise program and he got the hydrotherapy. At Town's hospital, there was a Princeton graduate named Dr. Silkworth who had made some money and put it into stocks hoping to build a new hospital, but the crash had taken away all his money and so Silkworth had come to be working at Towns Hospital. Dr. Silkworth thought that alcoholism was like an allergy, and the belladonna cure being used at Towns had been invented by Dr. Samuel and Alexander Lambert, and under Silkworth's care, Doc Bill W. thought he was saved. Silkworth said that the crash had been the turning point in his life because Towns Hospital brought him face first into the flotsam of humanity and he wanted to help people who needed him and when he left the hospital, Bill W. would be drunk within the month. Bill W. described himself as, quote, bedeviled with an obsession that condemned me to drink against my will and a bodily sensitivity that guaranteed early insanity at best, close quote. Pass it on, page 109. In March of 1934, Lois quit her $19 a week job demonstrating folding card tables in the furniture department of Macy's to take Bill W. back to Vermont for the summer, where he would stay sober for weeks at a time. But Bill always started drinking again when they came back to New York City, and Bill ended up in towns again on the 17th of September in 1934, showing signs of brain damage this time, and Silkworth told Lois that it was time to have Bill locked up for good. When Bill W. again left Towns Hospital, he was, quote, really terror-stricken, close quote, and that kept him sober for weeks and then for months, and Bill, quote, even went to Wall Street and fell into a few small deals that brought home a little cash, close quote, while Lois started working at Lozier's in September of 1934, and for Bill, things started looking better, a lot better, close quote. Later, Bill W. would write, Confidence was growing. And then came Armistice Day in 1934, and while Lois was working, Bill decided to go golfing on Staten Island because Wall Street was closed. On the Staten Island ferry, Bill W. sat, sat next to a man with a flying target rifle, and Bill waxed, 
waxed nostalgic about the Remington rifle his grandfather had given him at the age of eleven, and as they talked about shooting guns, the bus was rear-ended by another bus, so they walked into a bar to wait for the next available bus. Bill W. did not ask for alcohol, but ordered a ginger ale, and they got on the next bus to go to the golf course, and when they arrived, there was a bar where they could order some lunch, and the gunman ordered some alcohol. When the Irish bartender came over with free drinks for Armistice Day, Bill W. went ahead and had the front drink, and Lois found him on the doorstep the next morning with a bad cut on his head from his having run into the door. After that, Bill W. stayed home and drank incessantly, and he wrote nasty letters to politicians and to prominent people, until one day an old drinking buddy came to see Bill, and lo and behold, his friend was sober. Ebby had gotten religion, and he suggested that Bill W. give it a try. A few months before, Ebby had been fined several times for being drunk in public that summer of 1934 and it had cost him five dollars each time, and if he were fined again, they had threatened to lock him up in Windsor Prison. Ebby had joined an Oxford group after two of his former drinking buddies came to visit and offered him a free membership, and the Oxford group had gotten them all to change. One of these former drinkers named Roland had been to Switzerland to see Carl Jung, and Jung told Roland that it didn't matter whether or not he believed in God, but that he better find out how to have a serious spiritual experience if he wanted to be cured of alcoholism. Roland took Jung's treatment for a year, along with all the other rich people doing the health nut regimens that were all the rage at the time with the Nazis, and Ebby would start drinking again shortly after he went to see Bill W., Ebby had decided to paint his house, but first he needed to get drunk to do it. And there were some pigeons sitting there on the roof, so Ebby had gotten a double-barreled shotgun and started shooting them, and the neighbors called the police. Instead of going to jail, Roland from the Oxford group came to court and asked the judge to release Ebby into his care, and Ebby stayed with one Oxforder after another until he ended up with one of them who was running the Calvary Episcopal Mission on 23rd Street in New York City, and someone there told him about poor drunken Bill W., and Ebby went to see Bill. The Oxford Group men, living at the Calvary Mission, called themselves the Brotherhood, and a few days after Ebby went to see Bill, Ebby had come back with another Oxforder, and they laid out the Oxford Group principles for Bill W. at his kitchen table. Soon after that, Bill was inspired to go see Ebby and the other brothers at the Calvary Mission, even though Bill was very drunk, and Bill gave a totally intoxicated speech at their meeting where he stuck out because he was wearing a better suit. On the way to Calvary Mission, Bill had stopped at a bar and talked to a Finn named Alec, who was a sailmaker and a fisherman, and when Bill heard the word fisherman, he'd thought of the mission where there were fishers of men. And when he'd got to 246 East 23rd Street, he joined in the altar call and gave his life to Jesus. Three days later, Bill W. checked himself into Town's Hospital on the 11th of December, and it was two weeks after his 39th birthday, and he had drunk three bottles of beer and was carrying a fourth, and again he got the barbiturate and belladonna treatment. Bill W. thought about what Ebby and the Oxford groupers had said, and a few days later, Ebby came to visit Bill, who was terribly depressed that he wasn't as thrilled about God as Ebby, and Bill felt so bad that he asked God to show himself, and immediately Bill was electrified. Suddenly my room blazed with an indescribably white light. I was seized with an ecstasy beyond description. Every joy I had known was pale by comparison. The light, the ecstasy, I was conscious of nothing else for a time. Then, seen in the mind's eye, there was a mountain. I stood upon its summit, where a great wind blew, a wind, not of air, but of spirit, in great, clean strength it blew right through me. Then came the blazing thought, You are a free man. I know not at all how long I remained in this state, but finally the light and the ecstasy subsided. I again saw the wall of my room. As I became more quiet, a great peace.
peace stole over me, and this was accompanied by a sensation difficult to describe. I became acutely conscious conscious of a presence which presence with a capital p which seemed like a veritable sea of living spirit i lay on the shores of a new world this i thought must be the great reality the god of the preachers close quote pass it on page 121 bill was let out of town's hospital on the 18th of december in 1934 and he never had to drink again and Bill and Lois started going to the Oxford group meetings from that day onward. The Oxford groups were ten years old when Bill and Lois started going, and and the meetings they went to were at the Calvary House at the Episcopal Church where Sam Shoemaker was the rector, and at the time they were called a first-century Christian fellowship. The Oxford groups had been started by a Pennsylvania Dutch German named Frank Buchmann, who was a Lutheran minister, and Dr. Buchmann's father had been a butcher who owned a tavern and had described his son as having a, quote, wanderlust. Sam, Sh Sam Shoemaker had met Buchmann in China. Sam Shoemaker had met Buchmann in China in 1918, and Shoemaker had become an Oxforder. And when Buchmann came back to America, he started meeting with small groups of people to try to figure out how to help the Chinese with their opium problem. Buchmann went back to China via India, where Charles Barnes Towns had been sent by the American government to offer the Chinese a new cure for opium addiction. Ten years earlier, Buchmann had talked the Lutheran Church into letting him run an orphanage in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and in 1908 he'd gotten into a fight with the trustees over the food budget for his boys. Buchmann went on vacation to England, all bent out of shape, where he heard a Salvation Army lady speaking in Keswick, England, and she said that resentment cuts us off from the sunlight of the Spirit, and hearing that changed Buchmann's life. With his new revelation, Buchmann came back to America and worked as a secretary for the YMCA at Penn State for five years, and then he went to China for those six months in 1916, returning to America when his father was ill. Back in America, Buchmann started taking his small groups of people along with him, traveling and preaching, and Buchmann took his groups to college campuses where the students would sit around and practice telling the truth. Buchmann was good at getting people to donate money towards his evangelical work, and the groups had no central office and no official membership lists, but people would gather together and call themselves a group, and then take turns having meetings in each other's homes. Rich people enjoyed the meetings because they were in the habit of having dinner parties already and needed new conversation at the table and the groups would sit in a circle and take turns talking to share their personal spiritual experiences. Radio and radar had just become well known, and Buchmann said that people were like radio antennas and that God was, quote, a perpetual broadcasting station and all you need to do is tune in, close quote. The Ox took science very seriously and would ask how you would feel if your thoughts were flashed up on a screen and they would listen together for God's voice during the meetings and sometimes it would get a little weird but that just kept it interesting. The groups didn't even have a name at first and were just called Buchmanites and the meetings caught on because they were very simple and the house parties were popular because dinner parties were all the rage and so were seances and what was different about Buchmann's meetings was that people sat around listening to God instead of talking about him. The meetings were informal and they called each other by their first names and they stressed anonymity so the rich people would feel more comfortable sharing and the sharing was considered as personal house cleaning and they also believed in making amends. Buchmann told new people to experiment with God rather than just take someone's word for matters of religion or faith and the group sought absolute honesty, absolute purity, 
absolute unselfishness and absolute love and every day they would have morning meditation for a half hour when they would listen to god and they would try to communicate by hearing him through quote two-way prayer the bukmanites wanted to think god's thoughts after him and they read the bible often and they counted on direct inspiration from god for personal guidance and when someone got with the program they called it getting changed what little doctrine they had was based on individual responsibility with no formal organization and divine guidance and divine guidance that was shared with the group or others and the groups had plenty of slogans such as crows are black the world over and fake it until you make it and your best thinking got you here and p r a y powerful radiograms always yours Another slogan was a spiritual radiogram in every home because the radio was the new miracle, and to the Oxfordiers, praying was the same as transmitting radio waves. When one of the groups went to South Africa in 1928, they'd been called those people from Oxford because they'd just been to England at a previous stop, and a porter had put tags on their luggage saying Oxford. The South Africans knew about Oxford University, and to them, the Bukmanites were fancy people because South Africa was a long way away from civilization. The name Oxford stuck, even though the Oxford groups had nothing to do with Oxford. And Bukman had not liked the term Bukmanism, and thought the name Oxford groups gave his mo movement more dignity. Bookman lived in a very nice house on West 53rd Street, and the house was owned by John D. Rockefeller, because the woman holding the lease was, lease was in the Oxford groups, and Bookman had a tea for the Queen of Romania in that lovely house, and 200 people were invited, but the Queen was suffering from a cold and left early, although she had asked Bookman to, quote, read her sins in her face, close quote, so he had said, pride and self-satisfaction, and it had just been a wild guess. Baronesses and countesses from all over northern Europe would come to visit Bookman, and his Oxfordiers would meet for house parties in the homes of rich people, where plenty of famous people showed up, and sometimes the famous people only came once, but they would come, and Edward VIII even went with Wallace a few times. Bookman's house parties became very trendy with social climbers, and Mr. and Mrs. Henry Ford became Oxford groupers, and Mrs. Vanderbilt threw a house party for Bookman, and Mrs. Edison gave a dinner party for him, and she invited over 100 people, and she compared Bookman to her husband's light bulb. Even though the Oxforders concentrated on recruiting the rich and famous, the common desire in Bookman's meetings was to know the will of God, and they would gather together and ask God to reveal himself, and then listen for inspiration from the Spirit. What was different about the Oxford groups was that people were sitting and listening to God for the first time, and God seemed to like it, and with no dues or membership roles, and no paid leaders or formal rules for the meetings, it was easy to join and easy to belong, and it was also a lot of fun. Bill W. began having separate Oxford group meetings at Clinton Street for alcoholics only, and the Oxfordiers called his meetings those, quote, held surreptitiously behind Mrs. Jones' barn, close quote. Pass it on, page 169. Before the end of 1935, when Germany had just passed the Nuremberg Laws, the Oxford group leaders told their members not to go to Bill and Lois's house anymore because the focus on alcoholism was said to be contrary to the goals of the Oxford group movement, especially because in pushing towards recruitment of rich and famous people who could finance and drive forward publicity, the issue of not drinking would certainly offend too many potential members. By the grace of God, Bill W. was sent to Akron, Ohio, to try to win a shareholder vote of the board of the National Rubber Machinery Company, 
and Oxfordiers had previously been invited to Akron by the Goodyear Tire Company because they'd gotten the president's son sober on a train ride from Denver in 1931, even though he'd started drinking again a few years later. And after staying ten days with Goodyear, the Oxfordiers had gone on to St. Louis to work on Mr. Bush's drunken son. Akron was a one-industry town manufacturing tires for cars and trucks, and the owner of Goodyear was a German named Frank Sieberling, who had, mer who had named his country after the Charles Goodyear who discovered how to vulcanize rubber in 1839. By 1913, Sieberling's machines in Akron were producing half the tires made in America, and by 1926, Goodyear had become the largest rubber company in the world. There was nothing much else going on in Akron other than the rubber tire industry, and Goodyear's owner Sieberling had become a mega philanthropist, and he built hospitals and schools and accomplished many projects with his great wealth, pursuing ventures that would benefit his employees. And there were other rubber companies in Akron, including Firestone, so it could be said that it was in Akron where the rubber meets the road. Firestone had started a rubber f plantation in Liberia in 1926 by loaning the Liberians $5 million and leasing 1 million acres of land from them. And an American was ensconced with the Liberian government to supervise the collection of rent from Firestone and to oversee the profits on the production of rubber. And the language they used with the natives was Portuguese. Firestone built homes for the workers in Liberia that numbered in the tens of thousands. And he also built medical clinic clinics and schools and roads. And several hundred Americans lived on the rubber plantation where they made vacuum hoses and galoshes, but mostly they made tires. To each group of laborers a district is allotted, containing about 100 to 150 rubber trees. Footpaths having been made through the forest to the separate trees, the tapping operation begins. With the aid of a mushado, a short-handled hatchet of American manufacture which has now been generally introduced, incisions are made in the bark of the tree. This operation commences at daybreak. Beneath each incision is fixed a small collecting vessel to catch the latex which trickles out. 150 trees yields on average about 45 liters of latex at each tapping. <coughs> Assuming that the whole collecting season includes 20 tappings, <coughs> one estrada footpath will yield on average about 900 liters of latex <coughs> taken in the calabashas to the storage place and is there worked up to rubber in the following way. The latex is poured onto flat dishes from which it is scooped out and poured over a thick stick supported at one end on a rough wooden framework, the stick with the adherent latex being then rotated by the hands while it is held in the smoke from a fire. The formation of a thin pellic pellicle of rubber round the stick is brought about partly by the heat of the fire and partly by the action of the chemical compounds contained in the smoke. By the repetition of this operation, a ball of rubber is gradually built up. The Manufacture of Rubber Goods, a practical handbook for the use of manufacturers, chemists, and others by Adolf Heil and Dr. W. Esch, translated from the German by Edward W. Lewis, London, Charles Griffin and Company, Limited, 1919, page 7 and 8. On the rubber plantation, machines were introduced to turn the latex into rubber instead of groups of people having to hold the big sticks over the fires. And huge machines washed the rubber rather than it being done by hand. And in this book, the machines were stamped with their makers' names. Harberger Eisenwerk, C.G. Haubold Chemnitz, Gebauer of Berlin, and the machines for drying the rubber were stamped with Mühlenbauenstalt und Maschinenfabrik Vorm Gebrüder Sek Dresden, 
For every German machine, there was an English one from David Bridge and Company Engineers, Castleton, Manchester, and Francis Shaw and Company Engineers, Bradford, Manchester, England, while other mach machines just said Humboldt. And on the 7th of December in 1942, the British West African silver would be retired and replaced by the U.S. dollar to become the currency of Liberia. No matter how successful and good Mr. Firestone was, he would be no match for his son's drinking problem, and when Firestone invited the Oxford groups to visit Akron, they had become established in the city where Bill W. would be sent on business in 1935, after he had gotten sober from a visit by the Oxfordiers who were meeting at Sam Shoemaker's Cavalry House. Calvary House. And Akron had been named after the Greek word that meant summit or peak, and Akron was in Summit County, Ohio. The National Rubber Machinery Company was in the business of making things needed by the tire factories, and the price of rubber had fallen with the Depression, and Akron had seriously begun to suffer and was in need of an infusion of capital from the stock market. Bill W. was sent with some co-workers to make them an offer, but he lost the stockholder vote to a Swedish guy, and his co-workers went back to New York, leaving Bill behind at the Mayflower Hotel. Bill heard the glasses full of alcohol clinking down the hall as laughter floated toward him from the hotel bar, and he looked at the telephone directory next to the phone booths, hoping to find an Oxford group. He looked down the church directory and picked out Dr. Tunks because of the name. It was a funny name, so Bill thought he'd call him just on that basis. He called and asked if there were any Oxford groups in the church, and Dr. Tunks said, Yes, I do have a chapter here, and gave him a list of names. Children of the Healer, the story of Dr. Bob's Kids, by Bob Smith and Sue Smith Windows, as told to P. Kristen, Kristen, Christine Brewer, Illinois, Parkside Publishing Corporation, 1992, page 35. When he called Reverend Tunks, Bill W. had been sober for five months and had been attending Oxforder meetings, and the woman in the Oxford group that he called was the daughter-in-law of the Goodyear Company's owner, and she'd been living in the gatehouse with her three teenage children while her husband was living in the mansion with his family. Bill W. had discovered that the secret to staying sober was talking with other sober alcoholics, and Mrs. Mrs. Sieberling had been going to the Oxford meetings and knew an alcoholic that Bill W. might be able to help, and she would say later that she'd been praying for God to send someone to help Dr. Bob Holbrook-Smith after she'd heard in a meeting something along these lines. I have a secret problem. What is it, Dr. Bob? It's a terrible thing that nobody knows. You can share it, Bob. We're here for you. I'm so afraid that if people knew I would be ruined for life. It will never get any better if you keep it secret, Bob. All right, then. I'm an alcoholic. I drink every day. I can't get through a day without at least one or two drinks and sometimes more. The stunned looks on their faces had told Dr. Bob that they were shocked to find out he had such a problem with his drinking but the truth was that they were stunned to discover he thought they didn't know. Dr. Bob and his wife Anne had been going to the Oxforder meetings for two and a half years when, Doc, when Bill W. showed up, and at the time a doctor was earning $5,000 a year, but with the Depression, Dr. Bob had been letting most of his patients slide, and he had a drawer full of unpaid bills, and Dr. Bob would have lost his house except for the mortgage moratorium declared by FDR in 1933 that let people stay in their houses even though they couldn't make their mortgage payments. Bill W. and Dr. Bob were both from Vermont, and they'd both gotten married within one year of each other, Bill in January of 1918, and Dr. Bob the summer before and their mutual love of the effect of alcohol welded a bond between them that would outlast their mortal existence. Dr. Bob had been born in St. Johnsbury, Vermont in 1879, and he grew up 90 miles away from Bill W., and Dr. Bob went to Dartmouth in Hanover, New, New Hampshire. 
where he joined the Kappa 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 fraternity and majored in drinking. Dr. Bob graduated in 1902 and worked for three years selling platform scales for the trucking industry until he enrolled at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor in 1905 to study medicine. Dr. Bob transferred to Rush Medical College in Chicago in the fall of 1907, and he would graduate from Rush Medical in 1910. When Dr. Bob had been a senior in high school, he met a woman at a dance in Vermont named Ann Robinson Ripley, who was an undergraduate at Wellesley College, and Ann lived in Oak Park, Illinois, a half-hour drive from Rush Medical, and she would marry Dr. Bob after a 17-year whirlwind courtship, which meant it took 17 years for him to, for her to talk him into it. After graduating from Wellesley, Anne had gone back to Oak Park to teach school, so Dr. Bob had been able to visit her frequently after he transferred to Rush Medical. As Dr. Bob's drinking increased, he thought that becoming a surgeon would allow him to keep better hours, so he went to the Mayo Clinic for further training to become a proctology surgeon. Rush Medical in Chicago was named after the only doctor to have signed the Declaration of Independence, and Dr. Rush had taught Clark of Lewis and Clark the doctoring skills he needed for his adventure to the Pacific. While Dr. Bob was at Rush Medical, the Saddlers from Battle Creek had just graduated the year before in 1906, and the Saddlers were practicing medicine in Chicago by blending science with the Bible. <laughs>